good morning. Welcome to CAPEX CMP Classroom. Our today's topic is quite relevant and interesting topic that's called digital forensics. These days, wherever we go, whatever client we are serving to, we are basically dealing with the digital evidences. Let's try to understand what is the meaning of digital evidences. Digital evidences are those evidences which are stored in digital devices in binary form. Binary stands for 0 and 1. And we understand that computer only understands the binary language which is in zeros and 1. There are two words which we have to understand here before we proceed with the discussion. There is something called digital investigation and there is something called digital forensics. Most of the people use these two words interchangeably, but that's not the fact. There are differences between these two words, digital forensics and digital investigation. Digital investigation is an investigation of data which might be in digital devices in digital form. Digital forensics is recovery and investigation of the data from the digital device, we call that digital forensics. So now when we understand the difference between digital investigation and digital forensics, let's try to understand more about something called digital evidences. As we understood, digital evidences is always stored in either smartphones, a tab or a computer system. So here the computer or the related accessories can be very very important for our investigation. We as a fraud investigator may not be an expert in a lot of fields and that's where we are supposed to take a help from digital experts. Digital forensic experts are those experts which, which, who are specialized into recovery of those evidences which are stored in digital devices. They can do multiple tasks for us. For example, they can recover the permanently deleted files. They can recover the files from the system if it's hidden, provided it is not overwritten. They can get the access of log files. They can tell you what all websites were searched. They can do a lot of activities which can be very, very crucial for our investigation related to computer system. So they can crack the password, they can recover the files which are deleted, they can create the log files, they can also recover the files which are reformatted. Sometimes people get their systems formatted. So those digital experts can also recover those files which are reformatted. So these are the things which can digital experts can do for us. We should never try to get into that kind of area which we do not have specialization in. My suggestion is that whenever you are doing the investigation related to digital tools, try to take help of a digital expert. At the same time, it's very crucial for us to contact a law enforcement officers or take legal opinion. Every jurisdiction has their own policies related to digital evidences. You should know whether these digital evidences are acceptable or not. At the same time, what are the mode uh, which are legal? What you can do, what you cannot do legally, that is very crucial for us to understand why we do the digital investigation. For example, if you are trying to hear somebody's conversation and try to get hold of CDR, you should understand that we cannot have access to CDR without the legal permission or without the permission from law enforcement officers. If you try to get it illegally, a person can be behind the bar for at least five years. It's a non believable crime. So we need to be very sure as to what kind of means we can adopt, what we cannot. Now let's try to understand how computer design the files. There are P3 type of files in computer. User generated files, user protected files and computer generated files. User created files could be any file in the form of text, spreadsheet, emails or anything which user have created. That's called user created file. User protected files are those protected files 
which user have protected in setting forms. They have given some passwords, they have encrypted or they have gone for stenography. What is stenography? Stenography is a mean through which you try to hide the message in innocent looking files. For example, if you try to hide your message in a very innocent looking less significant image file, that's called stenography. There are a lot of cases where employees have caught into these kind of stenography method where they were trying to convey the message to third party through the internal computer system of organization hiding those into innocent looking files such as jpg or such as any image file unless and until you will compare the original image file with this file you may not be able to know that there is any difference between these two files the way the message is being hidden it do not it does not increase the size of the file to be very frank you have to really compare these two set of files if you, in order to understand whether there is any difference between these two files or not. So stenography can be very crucial for our investigation and it is recommended that you compare both the files together, the original files and the file which you are having any suspicion of. So that's what we call user protected files. The third kind of file is computer generated files. Computer generated files or the system generated files are those files which system generates on its own. Many times user would not even be aware of that these files are being created. The example of computer generated file could be log file, metadata, any file which includes the history of your website you visited and so on. These are the files which computer generate on its own and that can be very important for our digital investigation. So we understood the files are of three types, computer generated, computer, oh, sorry, user generated, user protected and computer generated. Now let's try to understand how do we go for digital investigation. There are certain steps involved, we have to follow all those steps. Step number one, planning. Step number two, seizing. Step number three, imaging. Step number four, analyzing. Five, reporting and testifying. So these five steps are very, very important for us for digital investigation. Even for CFP examination, these stages or steps could be asked in examination. At planning phase, we plan as to what are we planning to capture. What exactly is the area which we are going to cover under our digital forensics? It's not always that digital evidences can be stored only in the main computer system. It could also be scattered on any kind of devices such as hard disk, pen drive, any external uh, accessories which can be used with the computer system. It could be on workstations, it could be on your smartphone, it could be on any tablet. So we have to understand that we what all devices we are going to capture. We call that planning phase. Then phase number two go for which is called seizing. As an investigator in private investigation, we do not need a specific legal permission to search and seize. But as we have already understood in our law section that any government official needs a legal permission for search and seizing. But in private investigation, generally search and seizure permissions are not required. But at the same time, make sure that you are not crossing the privacy law of that particular country. You should always take legal opinion before going for such kind of search and seizures. Coming back to seizure, we have to understand that digital evidences are very, very volatile. Unlike your typical uh, thing which can be accessed very easily and can be stored easily, digital evidences are very volatile in nature. If you do not handle those evidences properly, you may end up spoiling the evidence. So we need to be very very sure as to how we are seizing and how we are storing it for future purpose. There are certain do's and don'ts. One, 
If the computer is on, let it be on. Do not try to shut it off. The moment computer is shut down, all the files and system will be closed. Do not do it. If it's a laptop, the moment you put it down, it will go in sleep mode and it will start from where it was. If it is a desktop, please switch the main button off and take it. If computer is on, capture it the same position. If it is off, do not try to switch it on. Whenever you are going for seizure, the first thing that we have to do is please click a picture of the scene. When you went, what did you see? The computer was in what position, but all accessories were involved with that computer. It includes the networking wire, all the accessories like pen drive, hard disk, anything. It includes the computer's picture, whether it was on or off. This may help you with the future liability. Tomorrow, this client may sue you in the court saying that you have destroyed all his data which was there in the computer or there can be any other allegations. In order to save ourselves from those liability and for our future evidence uh, records also, we will try to capture these images. Do not forget to put your initials and date on the back side of the image. So as I said, if computer is on, let it be. If it is off, let it be. Do not try to temper with this. Second, try to capture the scene as live as you can. As I just said, click an image. What was the position when you saw it? As live as you can. Do not ever try to close any application which was open. Do not try to open new website or any file. If there is any file on the system, do not click on it. The moment you click, it will be overwritten. Even forensic expert may not be able to recreate it now. So avoid all those mistakes. Do not try to surf. Do not try to download anything. Do not try to, you know, install any kind of software in this system. You do not tamper with this main evidence, which may be either in smartphone or computer system or any other device. As I said, take it as live as it can be. Third, the moment you capture everything, don't just seize the main system, but seize everything along with it. Be it any peripheral devices, accessories, networking wire, the main electricity wire, or anything which is involved with the system, please seize the complete thing. Once it's done, and you think that this particular files or the data which is there in the device can be tempered with, it's always good to encrypt it. And the decryption key should be only and only with the forensic experts. So in this mode, the data will be live. It will not be tempered with. In court of law, if judge has small reason to be suspicious that this data has been tempered, this evidence will be altogether may become inadmissible. So we have to be careful when it is admissible, when it is inadmissible. We have to create complete chain of custody. So create complete set of chain with the images and the relevant document as to in which position did you seize it. From here, you send it where? How many days it was there with that expert or whomsoever you have given it to? When did you get it back? This complete chain of custody should be there in your record. Probably the judge might ask for it. So we have to create complete chain of custody. Now once we understood that how to seize it, it's time for us to go for imaging. Imaging is done, being done these days through softwares. There are various softwares available which images the device. It could be your computer, it could be your smartphone or any other electronic digital device. When we image it, now you can analyze it the way you want. You are not actually playing with the main system but you are playing with the image. That is where you can analyze it without tempering the original files. So it's always advisable to image. Then once it's been imaged, it's time for us to interpret and analyze it. What all data is there, what who has created and so on. 
finally, our task is to report and testify. So, basis the digital evidence is we are going to create our report and then if required we will go to the court and we will testify the data. So, these are the steps which are involved for us. Our data can be stored in the computer system, printer, fax, any accessories, mobile phone, any tablet. We have to be very careful and we have to understand our scope of work as to where all we can find this data. Not always that suspect has created all file in his computer system only. It is also relevant for us here to understand a concept of cloud. Many of you must be aware of that these days we do have cloud storage. Cloud storage is a scenario where we do not have any physical server but the data is stored at third parties cloud which is basically online. Cloud has its own benefits. It's low cost, you can very easily store your data from wherever you are. But at the same time, cloud also gives a lot of trouble to fraud investigator or any investigator or auditor in their task. Some of the challenges which we may face with this cloud is, we might not have specialized tool to handle it. The jurisdiction is another problem because cloud is online. So which country's jurisdiction will be applicable, that's another challenge. Third, there is no specific audit trail. Everything is online, you would not know what is the audit trail. Sometimes it's challenging for fraud investigator to know which particular third party's cloud is being used. The suggestion here is, if you look at the data very carefully, you get some clues. For example, there may be certain payments to a particular third party or there is some invoice which may be stored on the system which is actually for this cloud storage. These are just thumb rules which can be followed if you want to know which third party cloud is being used. But overall cloud storage is basically a challenge for our investigation due to a lot of issues, lack of knowledge, lack of jurisdiction, lack of specialized tools, lack of audit trail and so on. No matter what, these days most of our clients may have a cloud storage. So ideally we need to get more trained and we need to have more specialized tool to handle this one. Finally this chapter talks about various softwares which are available for digital forensics such as forensic toolkit and case and so on. These tools are generally not being asked in examination. It's good to know knowledge for you. In nutshell that's all about this chapter. From examination perspective what is most important is the stages involved in digital forensics, the problem what we face in cloud storage, what are the do's and don'ts when you seize the digital evidences, the difference between digital forensic and investigation and so on. Overall, it's an important chapter for examination, also for your practical investigation purpose. So that's all from my end for this session. In next class, I'll be coming with a new topic. Till then, stay tuned.